So this video series, I want to dig deeper into the Chromenco D plus 7 AIO card that was available for S100 systems and get into how it's implemented in the uh, High Nibbles MSI and Chromenco emulation systems using the S132 card that the High Nibble provides. Uh, the S132 card actually provides a way to talk outside of the emulation system to the real world. You can actually measure analog voltages out in the real world. Uh, produce analog voltages that go into the real world and, and do port I.O., do bit I.O. again to the real world. So it's an interesting implementation that takes the closed emulation system and actually opens up the ability to talk to the real world in the emulation system and control that. So back in the day, Kremenko sold a card known as the D plus 7 AIO. We've got a picture of it here on the screen. This was a card that dropped down into an S100 bus machine. This connector down here. Uh, and it provided analog and digital I.O. through the connector up here. So for analog I.O., I mean it could produce a voltage output. Uh, for digital I.O., it means it could produce a digital output, which was, is a 1 or 0, or an analog output is a voltage. You know, a voltage between some range of voltages. It could also measure incoming voltages within a range and provide that information back to the microprocessor. Uh, was an interesting card back in the day. It's interesting to play with in today's world, at least the emulation of it. Uh, there's a note here I've made uh, here in that the original S100 machine had both a positive and negative voltage rail available to it. And that allowed the original card to actually produce negative or positive voltages out into the world. Because of the limitations of the ESP32 processor, that the emulation shifts that into a positive voltage range only. It's just a limitation of the ESP32 uh, that when Dave designed this card, you know, the emulation of this card he had to live within. Still, it provides, you know, an excellent emulation of what went on. Uh, so really, I think that hits this part. Let's jump in and dive deeper. So you may want to have some coffee ready here. This may get a... Uh, little boring it may not listening to me drone on is always fun i know so with a bit of coffee on board let's talk about how this card worked and things you're going to need to know if you actually want to use this card uh, in the emulation system so the concept of ports is something that's going to be important to understand as we get later into the material and begin to understand how to control the card from say a c program or maybe even basic uh, under cpm if you come from the world of the 6502 microprocessor, ports may be a new concept. They may not. If you come from the world of the 8080 and Z80 processor, you're probably old hat with them. But uh, bear with us while we move through this content. So the 6502, 8080, and Z80 all had RAM, random access memory. 64K was available to these machines, random access memory. It had a 16-bit address bus. Uh, and this RAM is typically where your programs and data are loaded. And the 6502 I.O. was done typically through what's called memory mapped I.O. An example of this might be video RAM. So machines like the Commodore C64 had a block of RAM someplace in that 64K address space that, that was the video RAM. And if the processor wanted to put a character on the screen, it would simply write to an address in memory where that RAM was mapped to. Uh, so your I.O. to video and often other devices was done by writing or reading from addresses in that 64K physical address space. The 8080 and Z80 and really later Intel style microprocessors add the concepts of ports. So while they both offer 64K of RAM, you know, the 8080 and Z80, they also offer 256 ports. Uh, what that means is you could do reads or writes, but it wasn't to memory. It was to something external called a port. Uh, let me kind of read forward here and see if I'm capturing all of this. So, as I said, when you're talking to random access memory, you've got physical memory someplace in the machine. And you're writing a byte to it or reading a byte from it. And part of that RAM could be video memory to get characters on the screen. Port I.O., works a little bit like memory I.O., although it expects an external device to be listening for that port address. 
And if it's a ride, it expects that device to grab that data and maybe latch it, hold on to it. It expects that device to receive that data and do something with it. If you do an import in, on these processors, the machine's going to go out and there's going to be some signals on the bus that say, hey, I want to read the data from this port. And it was the responsibility of the I.O. card, again, monitoring that port, to say, here is your data, uh, and to hand it back. So it's a little bit like RAM reading and writing, except it doesn't have necessarily RAM sitting there to receive your data or to provide your data back. It's expecting some I.O. device to be listening for a, a reader or write to a specific port address or a set of addresses and say, yes, I'll accept the data or here's the data uh, you asked for. Uh, if you've worked in languages such as BASIC and you've seen a command like DD equals NPP, so, you know, A equals N32, that is an implementation in BASIC of saying, go out and get the eight bits of data from port 32 and put it into the variable DD. You may have also seen uh, instructions in BASIC like out PPDD, where it's out to this port number, this data. These commands specifically use the port IO structure on the 8080 or Z80 to write a byte or read a byte. Uh, equivalence of these in the 6502 world might be a peak. So go to this memory address and peak is what at, at the date of this address. And addresses in RAM, that address might represent the status of a floppy drive. Uh, out to a uh, poke, which writes to RAM and be kind of the equivalent of an out. Poke would say write a byte someplace in the memory space. And that might be an address that's a character on the screen. It might be, you know, a memory address that controls some physical device. Uh, anything really else to say here. We're going to be coding later on in this to control the D plus 7 AIO emulation from C uh, under CPM. Uh, and C doesn't inherently provide functions for port IO, but it was often provided by compilers back in the day. And the commands were typically in for an importer. The function name was in and the function name was out in to read from a port out to write to it. Sometimes in those compilers, there was no built-in library. Report I.O. so you had to implement your own in assembly language. Just was what it was back in the day. Need a little swallow of coffee here. So what kind of things back in the day might that, you know, this D plus 7 AL card been used for? Well, it has analog inputs and outputs. It has digital inputs and outputs. There were games all the way back then that could use this board. Uh, analog joystick. It's kind of like the joystick on a modern controller where you can move through a range of motion and the computer knows where that joystick is. Well, the D plus 7 AL provided that same functionality way back then where you could have an analog joystick uh, and it could sense where you were in the motion across that. Let me see if I can get uh, one of the analog joysticks here that the high nibble provides. There's an analog joystick here that provides location data, just like on your modern controller, for the position of the joystick. There's also a D-pad, essentially, here that has four buttons on it that just do digital I.O. The button's close to the button's open. So this concept uh, that you may come across on a modern gaming console, where you've got a controller in your hand, well, this goes way, way back. This would have been pre the Nintendo, uh, the Atari, 2600, etc. You know, these concepts go way, way back. So, another common use case in the real world may have been industrial control. I needed to measure a pressure in a pipe or a temperature in a manufacturing process. Those are analog by nature. Uh, you could use the analog to digital converter on this card to go out and, and say, get me the pressure in this pipe, and it would come back as binary data, but it, that binary data would re represent that analog value. Same thing for temperature. Uh, so you could have things that did that, you know, had an analog output, and you could get a digital representation of those from the digital, or from the analog digital converter on the card. Uh, home automation, yeah, it really existed back then. You might want to know the temperature in the house, you could use an analog temperature sensor, use your MSI to read that, and if the temperature got below a value, 
command the furnace to come on or command the air conditioning to come on, you know, to cool down. Uh, maybe you were interested in the position of the garage door. How far open or closed was it? That could be provided as an analog input. Uh, so, you, you know, all kinds of things could be controlled here. It was really kind of up to your imagination to use them in a home setting or in a factory setting. Uh, next here, let's jump in and look at some literature that Kremenko provided back in the day about the card. So there's a manual, really a, a sales, some sales literature, and I'll provide a link to this down in the description, that goes through all the cards they had available back then. And one of the cards here is the D plus seven AIO card we're talking about. And there's a photo of the card and it gives you an idea of uses for the card. Uh, you know, they call out things here like uh, process control, which I hit on digital filtering, oscilloscope graphics, speech recognition, speech and music synthesis. There's analog outputs on this card. You could potentially produce music with it if you really wanted to. Uh, you know, it really, whatever you felt like you connect the card to with a bit of software, you could, and with the right hardware, control things. Uh, they talk about how it plugs directly into the Kremenko microcomputers. Well, it plugged into pretty much any S100 based machine. It could measure analog voltages in a range of minus 2.5 to plus 2.5 volts. So that gives you a, a, a bipolar voltage swing negative through ground to positive. Uh, limitations of the ESP32 don't allow that negative to positive impl implementation. That full voltage swing has shifted up uh, into the positive voltage range. And we'll dig deeper into that as we get deeper into the programming model for the card. And then there was just simple, uh, it's a simple uh, input output instructions, port reads, port writes, control the card. Uh, connector to the outside world is discussed. And there's some specifications here. It has seven input ports, seven analog input ports and seven analog output ports. Uh, it had eight bits of input digital data and eight bits of digital output data. And there's some specifications here on how fast it could do conversions and that kind of stuff. Kremenko also provided a user manual. This happens to be Revy, so it was a, a later version of the user manual. It gets into things like how you strap the card to know what ports to talk to. We've mentioned ports before are a way of reading and writing from a card that isn't mapped into the phys physical system memory. And often in an S100 machine, you had to go in and, and put on jumper links or solder wires in some place to tell the card, here's the range of ports you need to listen to. And they jump a bit into how you did that here with wire jumper links. Uh, it gives you uh, the pinout for that connector on the top of the card. Uh, it talks about two's complement representation. That's something you'll need to understand if you want to successfully use the analog input and output ability of the card. Two's complement is a way of representing a range of positive and negative numbers in an 8-bit digital value in a byte or maybe even an integer of two bytes. Uh, and it's just a way, like I say, of representing both positive and negative values uh, in, a, in a, you know, an integer or a byte. There's a process here for calibrating the original card. They give you some instructions you toggle in and do some things. And it digs into the analog output, the digital input, uh, and it starts to dig pretty deep. You know, source impedance and effects, input accuracy, output accuracy. There was lots of things you had to understand to really use this card and use it well back in the day. Uh, and this got into it. So you'd get your card in the mail from Kremenko. There'd be a user manual in the box. And you'd need to read through it and really understand that stuff. And really, one of the joys of using the emulated system here is you just really use... Uh, you know, the High Nibbles emulated systems, you really should deep dive down into how this stuff worked, what ports were, how you strapped ports, and how you read, you know, you know, read from ports and wrote to ports. And in the configurations you can create uh, on the machine, there's ways to control some of this uh, stuff in the emulation. And, you know, this was expected knowledge to have back in the day. You know, we've talked before about the Kremenko and MSI emulation are not turnkey systems. You don't just turn a key and it wakes up and it can do magical things. 
you had to really understand the hardware at some level to successfully use it well. Uh, gets into what analog I.O. is. Talks about they have a new joystick console available. We looked at Dave's implementation on one of these uh, a, a second ago. It, and, you know, and it, it is a physical representation of the schematic version of that joystick. He's really taken the schematic of that joystick and just made a new PC board to hold it. Uh, which is pretty cool, you know? I'm holding a joystick design from the 70s here in my hand to do something. Pretty cool. Uh, gets into service, it gets into calibration. You look at all this data, you know, it's worried about input and output impedance. It gets into assembling the card because typically you had to assemble these cards yourself. You got a blank board and a bag full of parts. Where the parts go on the board, what the parts are. You typically got a schematic of the card because there's a lot of information in the schematic. I've, you know, if you can't read a schematic, you might want to learn to read a schematic, spend a bit of time. Because it really will force you to deep dive a little deeper into how this stuff was implemented, you know, on the electronics. Uh, so that really jumps us through a quick look at the manual. So let's take a bit deeper dive into the High Nibbles implementation of this. Uh, there's a card called the S132 uh, that Dave produces that does a number of things for you. It does VT100 emulation. So the VT100 was a, a terminal that was provided by Digital Information or D Digital Information, Digital Equipment Corporation or DEC that was a CRT based terminal. It had a CRT for you know text and output and it had a keyboard for input. Talked over an RS232 line back to whatever your DEC or other system was. Uh, the VT100 was one of the first smart terminals in the world. Smart meaning you could tell it to clear the screen or position the cursor. There's all kinds of things you could do uh, to control what was being seen on the screen. And there's a very faithful implementation of the VT100 on this card. It uses a PS2 or USB keyboard and it uses a VGA monitor for output. And when you're sitting there with the you know the monitor in front of you and a keyboard, it's very much like it was back in the day using one of these machines on a terminal. Uh, he's extended the VT100 command set to add additional things like color. It's a very capable emulation and works really well. And I do a lot of stuff with it. It emulates the VIO system that I'm not going to really dive into here. That may be in a future video. It emulates the Dazzler. So because there's a VGA monitor sitting there, you have the ability to output different emulated things that dealt with video to that monitor. You could have the VT100 display on the monitor and run some software that did things on the Dazzler. The Dazzler was an add-on card that provided color graphics. It was potentially the first card accessible to a home user that could do color graphics on a TV set. And with a, a, a special keyboard combination on the keyboard you can jump between these various monitors so you can run a program say to run a game that uses dazzler graphics quick key combination on the keyboard you're not looking at the dazzler screen pick up your joystick and you're gaming so it's very capable there and then it provides this emulation of the d plus seven aio that's called out here and again this is what we're going to dive a little deeper into and in a video two or two going forward we'll actually program against uh in the kit when you buy it you get an interface card here that he calls the joystick adapter and you get the card that the joystick itself goes on i've showed this multiple times this is the joystick card uh it's got a ribbon cable that feeds off to the interface card that plugs into the back of the machine uh Picture here what we just looked at, two joysticks, a little closer look at one. Uh, the interface card, so this interface card plugs into the S132 and, and gives it the electrical connections to be able to have an analog joystick and the digital buttons connect and be usable to the system. And note that I've added these pin headers here myself because we're going to use those to look when I program the card about what the card is doing. The analog voltage is outputting or a way to measure the voltage it's inputting in like a, a voltmeter to do comparisons. This is a picture of the S132 and the joystick interface card plugged into the back of my MSI emulation. 
you built one of these, you should recognize it. There's your ESP32 Pico kit processor that is the heart of the emulation system. And there's a connector here that the S132 plugs down into. And the S132 carries its own ESP32 uh, that provides all the functionality we talked about on this card and uses the digital analog and analog to digital capability of the ESP32 to provide that digital or that analog input and output on the card. Um, let's jump in here and talk about some of the differences in scaling and things. So the analog inputs and outputs are scaled a little differently in the High Nibbles implementation just because of limitations of the ESP32. As I mentioned earlier in, the original card uses a bipolar power supply, so it's got positive and negative voltage available to it. Uh, the S132 has a positive 5 or uh, regulated down to 3.3 volt supply. There is no negative supply available. Uh, we hit this earlier. The bytes written to are read from a port to control that analog output or to read the analog input are encoded in two's complement. It's an 8-bit two's complement value. If you don't know what two's complement is, Google it here and do a bit of reading. Uh, it'll give you a little more insight into how integer math works inside of a microprocessor and how you can represent both negative and positive values on a microprocessor. And this format, this two's complement format, makes the hardware that actually does the calculations easier to implement. By two's complement, we mean that the 8-bit value is signed. It can represent both positive and negative values. I've said this a dozen times now. Uh, the D plus 7 AI, AIO card can work with voltages and output voltages between about minus 2.5 to plus 2.5 volts because the S132 doesn't have the negative power supply. Uh, its input and output analog voltages represent a range from about 0, 0.0 to 3.3 volts. This isn't a huge deal because uh, it just doesn't matter how, how you're coding against it. Uh, if you need to actually worry about this space because you're doing a really deep emulation back in the world, there's ways to offset this to look like this range. Uh, on the D plus 7 AIO, back in the day on the real card with one of the real joysticks, the voltage range that the joystick output would run from minus 2.5 to say plus 2.5 volts. Uh, in this case, with a center voltage of 0 volts. The S132 implementation is about 1.62 volts center, and it'll swing down to 0, 0.0 volts or up to about the 3.3. And this is uh, in a, probably a few, well, it will be a future video. We're going to look at how to program and read this joystick and see uh, under CPM. So I've thrown kind of a little bit more data in here about what we're talking about. There's that two's complement binary representation here in an 8-bit field. Uh, in decimal, what this bit pattern in decimal represents 127, positive 127. And this bit pattern in that byte represents minus 128. Read up on two's complement if you don't understand this. And how these digital values map to essentially the analog voltages out in the real world that the D to A or A to D uh, are giving you. We've gone through a lot of conversation here to get to what I call a programming model. Programming model is how you think of something when you want to program against it. it you know, I guess the name is pretty obvious. We talked about I.O. ports. Uh, there's a range of ports that run. There's 256 ports available on the Z80 and 8080. Uh, because there's 256 ports, the port address is physically implemented as 8 bits. It can be you know, eight ones, eight zeros, or any combination in between. And it was the responsibility of the card assigned to that port to listen for a read or for a write and to take the appropriate actions. In the middle of the S132 card, let's actually scroll back up here, and take a look at this, is this set of pin headers here. So this right angle pin header is what plugs down into the S132 card itself. And there's a set of pins here that you can tap into either on the prototyping card or on the analog card here, the joystick card, to grab those signals. And so this set of, you know, this 2 by 20 set of pins here is what I'm representing here in the middle. It's really broke up into four sections. There's an analog input section. There's an analog output section. There's a digital input section and a digital output section. Uh, 
something to keep in mind, and again, we'll dig deeper into this, is when you're using the emulated D plus 7 AIO, there's some specific modes that you need to put the emulation into, the card into, so that it works the way you're going to expect it to. And there's some configurations on the S132 that you go into when you say the car is running in joystick audio mode or full I.O. mode. These are more about letting the emulation know your expectations of how the card is going to work or you know be used and gives the emulation in the right mode to do this. The card is the card and it does the work that it does. So if I go in and configure the emulation to say I'm in joystick audio mode, that's what the blue here represents. And over here, I talk about doing an import. We talked a bit about this. This might be an import command. Uh, so, you know, IN, INP, whatever it is in basic, it might be a function in C that can go out and say, for this port, give me back the eight bits of data that it represents. Port 1F hex would input from the analog input 7. So there's an analog voltage coming in. There's an analog to digital converter. That digital representation analog value is available if you read from port 1F for analog input 7. Remember that I mentioned there are seven analog inputs here. They each have a port assigned, and each one of these ports returns a byte. There's also a byte of digital information available on the card, and that's access through the pins down here on the connector. And this is a full byte, data 0 to data 7. And if you read from port 18 hex, You'll get back a byte that has all those bits in the single byte. And that's why I talk about here. And this is a typo. This is a mistake in my documentation. It's always at least one. So data N7 to data N0. This really should be bit 0 and bit 7. Uh, I got the documentation wrong, so sue me. If we jump over to the output side. We see the same thing. There's analog outputs here on the card, whereas on the original D plus 7 AIO, there were seven analog inputs. Limitations of the ESP32 really mean you only have two analog outputs. By default, the high nibble ties those to output three and output one. If you actually go look at Kremenko's documentation for the original joystick, it has a speaker in it to make sounds or play music or whatever. Their default positions or that analog output, music or sound or whatever, was analog output three and analog output one. And that's why the high nibbles chosen these as the defaults. There's a port number that you write to to get a voltage out of that, a port 1B or port 19 hex. There is a way to remap these in the system. I'm not going to jump into that, but there is a way to change these if, if you're trying to emulate something that used a different set of ports to do the analog output there, there, there's a way to deal with that and then there's the digital data out and in this case i got the documentation right bit seven to bit zero data out and this is where you can write a byte to and what the processor will do is it'll put the binary information on the data bus It'll issue an out command, an out port command. The external hardware needs to listen to that command and say, okay, I've grabbed the data and I've latched it. It's not being written necessarily to memory where it's persisted. It's up, as I said, to that device that's listening on that port to say, there's a byte of data, I'm going to accept it and do something with it. Uh, there's what he calls the full input output mode, which basically just provides everything, lets the emulation know that you're going to be doing everything here and you're not necessarily talking to joysticks you're talking to whatever analog input and output things you want to talk to and then there's what's called lpt pass-through mode and this emulates centronics parallel printer interface uh, and there's a way in the emulation to basically well to redirect printing in the emulation to go to a physical printer you could have a dot matrix printer sitting out there and actually use it from inside of the emulation so I find this pretty exciting. This is taking a closed emulation system and expanding it to go out and talk into the real world, you know, to measure analog voltages, to produce analog voltages, to read or write bytes from a, you know, a D-pad on a keep, you know, on a, on a little joystick or whatever you want. You know, those digital inputs could be, you know, what lights in this bedroom are on or off or just whatever you want it to be. It gives you a capability to bridge the gap to the real world.
from the closed ecosystem and the emulation system. It's just really sweet add-on in my opinion and it's something I've played extensively with. So in an upcoming video we're going to actually go in and use a C compiler under CPM and we're going to actually read these analog inputs and and look at them and you know play with them in the C code and display voltages. Uh, I'll be throwing a couple voltmeters up on screen so we can see the actual voltage that the joystick is outputting. And we'll be able to look at the digital representation of that voltage in real time in that C program. So that video will hopefully help to start to produce a way to understand deeper, if you don't, how the world of analog works in a digital computer and how the world of digital works, you know, you know for external inputs like the buttons here on the D-pad. So I think that covers everything I wanted to hit in this video. It's time for some more coffee. Coffee is my friend, though that's getting kind of cold and bitter, but it's coffee and that makes me happy. Uh, like I say, watch for a future video in this series because we'll be diving deeper into actually the programming models. Uh, I hope to actually get one of my parallel printers out and actually do some printing on it. But that's down the road. If you enjoyed this video, you found something useful in it, you know, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber and you think it's worth it, subscribe. Uh, I'm here not even really for the likes and dislikes. Uh, the channel's never been monetized. I don't monetize. I don't ask for Patreon money. I do this because I love doing this. And occasionally it helps somebody. And if it helped you, let me know. A comment, a like. With that said... I hope to see you in a future video.